gentlemen, welcome to the Shaw Prize Lecture 2010 by Professor David Julius, the Shaw Laureate in Life Science and Medicine 2010. May I first invite Professor Andrew Chen, Head of Shaw College, to deliver the welcoming speech. Professor Chen, please. Good afternoon. Professor David Julius, distinguished guests, fellow colleagues and students, ladies and gentlemen, eight years ago in 2002, the establishment of the Shaw Prize was announced in this particular auditorium. The Shaw Prize was established under the auspices of Sherman and Shaw in 2002 to honor individuals regardless of race, nationality and religious belief who have achieved significant breakthrough in academic and scientific research or applications which have a positive and profound impact on mankind. The Shaw Prize is dedicated to facilitating society's progress, enhancing the quality of life and enriching humanity's spiritual civilization. It consists of three annual awards. The first one, astronomy. The second, life science and medicine. And the third one, mathematical sciences. This year, the prize in life science and medicine was awarded to Professor David Julius. Professor and Chairman of the Department of Physiology at the University of California, San Francisco, USA. Today, we are deeply honored to have invited Professor Julius the Shaw Prize Laureate in Life Science and Medicine of 2010 to deliver a lecture on From Peppers to Peppermints, Natural Products as Props of the Pain Pathway. We are also grateful that Professor Yao Xiaoqiang, Professor of the School of Biomedical Sciences, will introduce our Honorable Laureate and to moderate the question and answer sessions afterwards. Shaw College is, for, is fortunate to enjoy the privilege of hosting the Shaw Prize Lecture. To us, this has a special meaning. Not only because the Shaw Prize and Shaw College have the, sum, uh, has the same benefactor, but also because we are exceptionally delighted to be here to witness the significance of the scientific advancement of mankind. We are grateful to Saran Ran for his generosity and particular concern for youth education, which made the formation of Shaw College at CUHK possible. Furthermore, we have the highest respect for his passion and commitment to the promotion of scientific advancement that made the establishment of the Shaw Prize feasible. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chen. Now, may I invite Professor Yao Xiaoqiang, Professor of the School of Biomedical Sciences and the facilitator of the, today's lecture, to introduce Professor David Julius. Uh, Professor Chong and uh, Professor Chen, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, today it's my honor and a privilege to introduce uh, Professor David Julius, the Shaw Prize winner in life science and medicine of this year. Professor Julius is honored for his uh, milestone work on the molecular mechanism underlying our sensations, including temperature sensations, pain sen sensations, and uh, other sensations. Professor Julius is uh, currently uh, the professor and chairman of the Department of Physiology at the UC San Francisco. And he's a member of the United States National Academy of Science, a fellow of the uh, American Academy of Arts and Science. And uh, Professor uh, Julius was born in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, obtained his undergraduate degree from the MIT, and obtained his uh, PhD uh, from uh, UC Berkeley, and eventually became a professor at UC San Francisco in 1990. And Professor Julius' work has been recognized by numerous awards. That's, of course, there are more than 10, to tell you the truth. Uh, for many of them, I cannot even pronounce, uh, because they are all from different countries. He's very popular. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, this here's the one I can uh, pronounce, Prince the Austria's Prize for Scientific Research of this year. Of course, now the best one here, the short prize in life science and uh, medicine of this year. Now, Professor Julius' research is our body's sensory systems, and he has made extraordinary contributions to the chip field and uh, to the sense to the sensory physiology as a whole. And his research asks question of how do we sense the temperature, how do we sense our pain, and how do we perceive our outside world. And I pretty much he used the, uh, the natural plant's product as a stimulus of a specific sensory pathway, and then utilize the genetic, electrophysiological, and a behavioral method to identify all these sensors. And as a result, Professor Julius and his group has identified V1, which is an ion channel that can sense the hot temperature, can sense the pain, and, a, and a chili peppers. And they also identify m 8 another channel for sensing cold temperature and menthol, and also a one is another channel that can sense the wasabi. Now, I'm not trying to bore you through with all these specific scientific term to put it to a simple way. If you go to the uh, Chinese restaurant and you eat a hot pepper, you get a burning sensation in your mouth, not because uh, Professor Julius's work, we now know it's a uh, uh, V1. If you go to the Japanese restaurant and you have a wasabi, you know, I, I call it uncomfortable feeling in my mouth. It's, it's not because of uh, Professor Julius's work, we now know it's a chip E1, okay? Now, uh, his, his work really give a new meaning for our body's five senses. We know everybody have five senses, okay? His research is on the five senses. So uh, I really cannot wait anymore, okay? Without delay, well, let's welcome Professor David Julius to give us his uh, exciting story. Professor David Julius. Thank you very much. It's really a great pleasure to be here. Uh, of course, being this year's Shaw, Shaw Laureate in Life Sciences is a, a special honor. And being chosen to give the lecture among all the laureates here in Shaw Colleges, I feel to be particularly fortunate uh, compared to the astronomers and mathematicians. Anyway, <laughs> too bad for them. Uh, well, I wanted to. Um, Thank you all for your kind hospitality and this wonderful reception. And um, I think for myself and for my institution, for UCSF, uh, receiving the Shaw Prize is really uh, a, a special honor because as a member of the Pacific Rim, and as I've learned over the last few days, is how many connections we have between Hong Kong and San Francisco. Uh, it's really wonderful to be here, and, um, and, and I'm very glad to represent that, that association, that interaction. All right, without uh, too much further ado, let me tell you about, uh, it's really, this is all about science, and so I've been looking forward to coming here and giving a seminar and telling you about what we've been doing over the years. Uh, I know this is a diverse audience, and so I've tried to include both some, uh, you know, detailed science and some more general uh, overview of what we do. So let me begin with the more general, uh, and as you've already heard, to tell you that really the focus of our research over the last decade or so has been to understand sensory physiology. So. Uh, so our senses enable us to appreciate the physical world. And how you appreciate the world is really dependent almost entirely on the biochemical and biophysical properties of your sensory nervous system uh, because it dictates what kind of forces, uh, both physical and chemical, that, you, that we as organisms can appreciate. Uh, and so it's really our, sense, our, our sensory, uh, different sensory physio physiological systems that allow us to appreciate uh, beautiful visual cues, wonderful perfumes and other scents, uh, taste of an ice cream on a hot day such as this one, uh, and the touch of a baby's foot or other uh, uh, somatosensory uh, experiences as we'll talk about, and beautiful music such as that we just heard. Uh, so our senses enable us to appreciate the physical world and what they really do is uh, by feeding this information into the central nervous system, they allow our brain to make an internal representation of our outside world. And so the world as it appears to us, for example, is different than how it appears to a honeybee or to a, uh, or to a mole that has no eyes but has sensory, uh, somatosensory feelers. 
And so every organism's view of the world is determined uh, to large part, if not entirely, by the sensory repertoire and the sort of biophysical properties that it has and the kinds of mostly stimuli that it can appreciate. Now, over the last few years, we have really focused on one aspect of, uh, of the sensory uh, repertoire, which colloquially is referred to as a sense of touch, but more accurately, which we refer to as somatosensation. And somatosensation uh, consists of a number of different submodalities, and they include uh, touch, which is the detection of mechanical stimulation of the body, proprioception, which is our ability to detect muscle displacement by stretch and to know where our limbs are uh, with regard to the gravitational field, thermosensation, our ability to detect changes in ambient temperature, and then finally nociception, which refers to a specialized aspect of somatosensation, uh, which is namely our ability to detect noxious stimuli uh, that lead to uh, pain perception. And these uh, different submodalities can be segregated to some degree neuroanatomically and certainly psychophysically in terms of how we perceive them. But as I think you'll come to appreciate in this seminar, there's certainly uh, almost certainly overlaps in terms of the molecular mechanisms that underlie these, such as the relationship between uh, thermosensation and nociception. So of these different modalities, what we've paid attention to mostly over the years and, and the framework in which we've studied this really has to do with our fascination and understanding this, our, our perception of painful stimuli. So why are we focused on nociception and pain? So uh, nociception, as I said, is the initial process of pain sensation. That is the process whereby sensory nerve endings in our foot or in our hand detect a noxious stimulus. Uh, and transduce and then transmit this information to the central nervous system. So no susception is to pain, for example, what phototransduction is to vision. Uh, and we study this system for a number of reasons, at least two of which I want to mention here. One is that uh, this is a, an extremely important system for our survival and well-being. Uh, as we know, uh, um, no susception and pain serves as a warning and protective system that tells us when we have or are about to experience uh, tissue injury and as such initiates uh, appropriate protective reflexes. And in people in whom this system is non-operative, either due to rare genetic mutations in this pathway or due to disease that render it inoperable, uh, their, um, their protective system is degraded and they often suffer uh, injuries uh, that can be life-threatening. Uh, so we need the system to survive uh, and understanding uh, how it works is, uh, is, is not only important but also uh, biologically quite interesting. Now in the long term, uh, we're also interested in this system because it exhibits great plasticity, as most of us know from our uh, daily experience. And that is that it's subject to tremendous variation, and I would argue perhaps more so than other sensory systems, uh, say vision or olfaction. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, this is often in the enhanced direction. And so under some circumstances, particularly under circumstances following tissue or nerve injury, uh, our sense of pain is enhanced. And under these conditions, pain at the pain system outlives its usefulness as an acute warning system and instead becomes chronic and debilitating. And one of the uh, long-term goals is to understand how this switch from acute to chronic phases occurs with the goal of either preventing or reversing it. So that's sort of the backdrop as to why we're interested in pain. Now, let me just give you a, a very quick primer as to the sort of the very basic neuroanatomical overview of the system. So uh, the, the so-called nociceptors that are involved in the initial detection of painful stimuli uh, are located in ganglia called dorsal root ganglia that flank the spinal cord and are nestled in between the vertebrae. Uh, and they send uh, a, a long projections out to a receptive field, such as cutaneous sites in your hand or, your, or, your, uh, or other parts of your somatotopic surface, as well as to visceral and vascular target organs. And then they send a shorter projection into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord where this information is relayed to a series of ascending spinothalamic tract neurons to carry the information from the periphery to the brain. Now, there's an anatomically equivalent ganglion that sits at the base of the brain called the trigeminal ganglia that does exactly the same thing but subserves uh, somatosensory input and nociceptive input to all areas of your body from the neck up. And we'll talk about those ganglia in a few minutes. But, uh, but for the most part, at least in mammals, these ganglia, the dorsal root and trigeminal ganglia, are not only anatomically but also genetically more or less identical. Uh, now, the cells within these ganglia are not all equivalent. In fact, they differ uh, in regard to um, uh, their, 
uh, neuroanatomical status as well as their functional status. So if you take a cross-section through these ganglia, you'll see at least three different sets of neurons. These include the A-alpha and A-beta uh, neurons, which are the, these larger diameter cells. And this, uh, this gray ring denotes the fact that they are heavily myelinated. They have a thick myelin sheath around them. Uh, and they give rise to, and, and they are involved in the detection of non-noxious stimuli, such as light touch and proprioception that I talked about a few minutes ago. Uh, in addition to this, there are so-called medium diameter myelinated cells and the small diameter unmyelinated nerve fibers uh, that are those that are particularly devoted to detection of noxious stimuli and therefore subserve the role of nociception. Uh, and, and this will be uh, uh, of interest later. So these are anatomically and functionally diverse neurons. And one of our goals is to understand what, how they differ molecularly and how they differ functionally. Now, studying uh, nociception and pain, or somatic sensation in general, I think it's fair to say that from a technical point of view, has been more challenging than studying other sensory systems. Uh, and there are a variety of reasons for, that, for this that I won't talk about at the moment. But uh, some years ago, we decided to approach this uh, through, uh, uh, to, take, to take an approach that would circumvent some of these technical issues. And that's one is really uh, a pharmacological approach using specific drugs. And the approach that we took is one that actually has a very rich history in the study of pain, and that is to turn to natural products and folk medicine as a way of trying to cue in on interesting molecules in this pathway. And in fact, uh, two uh, beautiful examples uh, that we know from history include the use of morphine from opium poppy and aspirin from willow barks as probes of molecules uh, involved in pain sensation or the regulation of pain. And of course, through the work of people like uh, Saul Snyder and others, we now know that, uh, that morphine was used to identify and characterize the main players in the opiate signaling pathway, including opioid receptors and opiate peptides that interact with these systems to suppress pain. Similarly, aspirin was used to identify cyclooxygenases as important players in the generation of inflammatory agents that are involved in pain hypersensitivity. Uh, at both the central and peripheral levels. And so uh, these, these natural products have turned out to be exquisitely important, exquisitely sensitive and interesting probes for delineating and discovering molecules that are involved in pain regulation, in this case, uh, in the, uh, in the um, cessation or down regulation of pain. And what we did some years ago was flip this coin over on the other side and ask if we could learn something by studying natural products that, uh, that generate pain. And, uh, and, and the main one in this field that's been worked on by many people in the field uh, is capsaicin, the main pungent ingredient in hot chili peppers, the so-called vanilloid compound, which we know, as we just heard, generates a very intense and burning pain sensation. Uh, and another one that we've worked on is menthol, which is, uh, of course, a cooling agent, is, 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 is the context in which we're familiar with this, but at high concentrations has also been described as an irritant, if for anyone knows who puts a very, very strong mint in their mouth. Uh, and then more recently, we have worked on these compounds, so-called isothiocyanate and thiosulfonate compounds that constitute the irritating or pungent ingredients in wasabi and other mustard plants, and in garlic and shallots and other members of the allium family. Now, what's remarkable about all these natural products uh, that, gen that have a pungent sensation is that they all work in the same way. So when you experience these molecules, usually by eating one of these plant products, this is not a taste or gustatory response, it's a pain response. And the way that they mediate their effects is to bind to sensory nerve terminals that, for example, innervate your lips or tongue or other regions of your mouth, uh, and to, and to uh, uh, um, activate a membrane conductance that allows sodium and calcium ions to flow into the nerve terminal. This initiates depolarization of the nerve fiber and sends a message to the spinal cord which you experience is acute pain. And if you're chopping a hot pepper and forget to wash your hands and stick your finger in your eye, it's exactly the same phenomenon. Now, the other thing that happens is that these nerve fibers, these so-called primary afferent nociceptors, are very unusual uh, among the class of neurons that you'd find in the mammalian nervous system. And that is that in addition to transmitting information centrally, they also transmit information peripherally. So they also have an antidromic release of uh, neuropeptides and other neurotransmitters, such that when the nerve terminal is activated, aside from sending information to the CNS, they release compounds, neurotransmitters peripherally, again, uh, peptides such as substance P, CGRP, ATP, and other transmitters, 
And this then interacts with cells in the periphery to generate uh, phenomena such as vascular leakage and vasodilation, which leads to a phenomenon called neurogenic inflammation to enhance the inflammatory response uh, as a consequence of robust activation of the nerve terminal. And uh, as we'll talk about later, this turns on a cycle of pain-inducing peripheral inflammation, which then enhances pain, which further causes more peripheral inflammation, uh, which is uh, an important part of inflammatory pain disorders. Now, what's more remarkable about the, uh, uh, even than the fact that all these pungent agents act on the same type of neuron is that they do so through the same molecular mechanism. So all the pungent agents that I talked about mediate their effects by interacting with one family of ion channels called trip channels. So let me tell you a little bit about these channels and how they were first discovered. Trip channels were not discovered in mammals, but they were initially discovered in Drosophila in the phototransduction pathway in the eye of the fly. And in the fly eye, light is perceived uh, as it is in mammals by activation of a G-protein coupled rhodopsin-like receptor that then signals through a G-protein coupled cas cascade which in invertebrates is a little different than in mammals and involves the activation of phospholipase C signaling systems. This leads to the cleavage of membrane lipids and the elaboration of these familiar second messengers, IP3, release of calcium from intracellular stores, and then the generation of diacylglycerol or other so-called polyunsaturated fatty acids. And there's been a big debate as to which of these second messengers, if any, activate these trip channels in the fly eye. Um, but now I think it's pretty clear that these polyunsaturated fatty acids are the main players. And through mechanism that's still a little mysterious, they activate the trip channel. Sodium ions flow into the phototransducing uh, 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 cell, and the, and the fly sees a flash of light. So these trip channels are, were first discovered for their importance in fly phototransduction, but we now know uh, that mammals contain many different varieties of trip channels. There are now over 30 members of this family. Uh, and this slide just briefly summarizes the fact that they can be divided into subfamilies. The trip C's are most like the ancestral fly channel, but there are many other members. And the awful truth about this is that we know very little about physiological roles for most of these channels. We really don't understand what they do in terms of physiology. We don't even know what activates most members of this family. Um, so there's great diversity in terms of physiological roles. In fact, there's little sequence homology within and across families. There's only, even among some of the closest relatives, only 40 or 45 percent amino acid identity. Uh, but one thing that we can say is that most retain some aspect of PLC regulation similar to the ancestral fly channel. <clears throat> and that is that they can either be activated directly downstream of PLC activation and therefore serve as so-called receptor-operated channels, or, as you'll see uh, a little bit later on, they can be modulated. Usually their activity can be enhanced, even if this isn't the primary route through which they're activated physiologically. Uh, so that's sort of a brief summary of trip channels in, in uh, invertebrate organisms. Uh, and what we've focused on uh, over the last few years, as you've heard, are the three members of this family. Trip V1, which is a target for capsaicin and other related vanilloid compounds from capsicum plants. Trip M8, which is the target for uh, menthol and other cooling agents from mint and other plants. And then Trip A1, which is the uh, target for these uh, reactive isothiocyanate and thiosulfonate compounds from mustard and allium plants, respectively. So let me first tell you what we found out about the first two members of this family, Trip V1 and Trip M8. So really, I think the main challenge in this field uh, has not been necessarily to discover the fact that some of these channels are are the targets for uh, pungent irritants from plants. That's a great starting point. But what we really want to know is why we have them. It's really an evolutionary accident that the plant has targeted these through uh, their pungent agents. But why does our body make these? What role do they play in normal somatosensation sensation and pain sensation? And some years ago, a very talented postdoctoral fellow in my lab named Mike Katerina, who now has his own group at Hopkins, found that when the capsaicin receptor now called trip V1, is expressed in a heterologous system here in a transfected mammalian cell, uh, we found that the receptor is not only robustly activated by capsaicin, but is activated by increases in ambient temperature, such that exposure of this cell to heat leads to opening of the ion channel and the transduction of sodium and calcium ions into the cell. And what's more, what Mike found is that the properties of this channel in terms of its thermosensitivity are quite remarkable. And that is that it shows a very specific threshold of activation, around 43 degrees. And as you can see from the shape of this curve, it exhibits a very, very 
uh, remarkable and profound allosteric and, uh, and heat sensitivity with a temperature coefficient of activation uh, measured by many laboratories to be greater than 20 and by some to be greater than 40. This is very unlike most other ion channels where the Q10 or the temperature coefficient of activation would be only around 1.4 fold. So these channels have a unique property to be uh, heat sensitive. And the threshold is interesting to us because if I were to take most people in this room and stick their hand in a series of water baths and ask them when they would experience, uh, when, when they would, uh, at what temperature they would tell me is a demarcation between uh, nice, comfortable warmth and uncomfortableness in terms of noxious heat, it would be somewhere between 40 and 45 degrees. So, uh, and, and, uh, and then some, uh, a couple of years later, David McKemmy and Werner Neuhauser from my lab also did similar experiments with the menthol receptor and showed that in fact you get the opposite effect, that the channel is activated not when you heat it, but when you cool it down with a very similar temperature response profile that's inverted. And these sort of observations have led us to propose the model in which these channels serve as molecular thermometers on the sensory nerve endings, for example, that innervate your skin or your lips or your eyes, uh, and that they are intrinsically sensitive to heat or to cold and at least provide some of the explanation as to how our nervous system can detect changes in ambient temperature. So what happens when you eat these natural products or a mint leaf or a chili pepper is that these agents, namely menthol and capsaicin, act as positive chemical allosteric modulators of the channel, and they decrease the temperature activation that's required for the channel to open, such that you need less heat to open the capsaicin receptor, less cold to open the menthol receptor, shifting the temperature required for activation to the midline, namely to normal body temperature, so that exposure to these chemical agents produces a psychophysical mimic of heating and cooling, respectively. Okay. And so we have tested this model uh, genetically by asking what happens if you make a mouse through genetic engineering in which the gene encoding the menthol receptor is now deleted from the repertoire of genes in the genome, and then to simply ask whether it has deficits in its ability to sense cold. And we've done a lot of studies on these mice in terms of recording from nerve fibers, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm just going to show you one piece of data because I think in some ways it's the most beautiful and the most demonstrable in terms of the, the uh, phenotype, and that's a behavioral study. So here what we've done is to uh, take this, in this case this is a wild type mouse, normal genome, and just put it on two identical plates, one at 30 degrees and one at 20, and you can see that this little creature is very smart. He knows that this is the more comfortable warm side and this is relatively cold, and he won't cross over this boundary and will stay in this side of the enclosure all day long if you leave him here. Okay, so he's very comfortable there, and presumably uh, this is an aversive response to cold. Now, if we take an animal that's missing the menthol receptor, uh, trypamate receptor, watch what happens. He has no ability, at least at these temperatures, to distinguish between the warm side and the cold side, and so has lost the capacity to experience cold, at least at these temperatures. And you can actually do a very nice quantitative study where you uh, ask how the animal responds to crossing over between the 30 degree side and this side as you drop the temperature and make it colder and colder and colder, and in essence get a temperature dose response curve for this behavior. And what you find is that, so the, of course the, the normal mice are shown here in gray, and the mutants are shown here in this sort of pinkish color. And a wild type animal, as you see, will distinguish between the sides quite readily. And as the temperature on this variable side gets colder and colder, he will spend more and more time on the 30 degree side. And you get this beautiful temperature response curve until virtually spends 95 or 100% on the warm side. If you look at an animal that lacks the menthol receptor, he can really not distinguish between the two sides and will spend equal amount of time, 50% time, on the warm side or on the cold side until you get to very cold temperatures. And What's interesting is that the animal also can detect noxious heat quite normally. So this is a modality specific effect. It's not affecting all temperature sensation, only the cold range. Uh, and, and the animal really can't tell the difference. When you get to really noxiously cold temperature, it can begin to sense cold. And, and one thing that we're wondering that we believe actually is that this represents not an acute measure of cold, but instead represents a post-injury response to, exposed, to uh, continued exposure of the paw in this case to a very cold surface. But this has raised one question as to whether at extreme cold conditions there are other mechanisms to sense cold. But I think what it shows is that 
for the vast majority of cold sensation over the range that most mammals would experience, the menthol receptor is the, is the major determinant of our ability to sense environmental changes in temperature in the cold range. Uh, so our model is, oh, this slide got a little messed up, this is supposed to be a, a mint leaf, that these trip channels uh, um, determine our ability to sense temperature. And one question is, are there multiple channels over this range? What role do they play? Uh, my group, other groups, such as Artem Potapudin's group, have looked at other members of this family and provided some evidence that, for example, they're involved in warm sensation, noxiously hot. Uh, but the, really, the main evidence for this comes from the genetic analysis of the capsaicin receptor and the menthol receptor. Now, uh, what do we know about coding? So one of the things that people are interested in, in who study sensory systems is to understand coding. And what that means is that what is the wiring diagram and how does our brain discriminate different percepts uh, uh, from different types of stimuli? So for example, how do we discriminate hot from cold, pressure from temperature, et cetera? And I think that this is a very difficult question to address in the pain field. In large, in large measure because of the anatomical complexity of the system. But we're beginning to get a little bit of progress in this regard. And of course, it really depends on having molecular markers that are linked to different functional subsets of nerve fibers so that we can trace their projections to the spinal cord and ultimately understand how they send their information to the brain and how this is discriminated uh, for different types of modalities. And I'll just show you at least one example, uh, rudimentary and in the beginning, of how we think about our, the ability of our nervous system to tell the difference between hot and cold stimuli. Uh, so as I said, there are different uh, cell types within the sensory ganglia. And what we've done is to raise antibody to uh, the capsaicin receptor and to the menthol receptor. Actually, this antibody was raised by a former postdoctoral fellow in my lab, Makoto Tamanaga. Uh, and, and then if you just uh, take a cross-section to these ganglia and stain the cells, what's apparent is that for the most part, cells that express the hot receptor and that express the cold receptor segregate into two distinct populations. There's some overlap, and the amount of overlap is a little bit of topic of discussion and debate, but for the most part, they're separate populations. And this suggests that at least to a first approximation, cold and heat are sensed through separate so-called labeled lines that the way that our nervous system discriminates, at least at the level of the periphery, between a hot stimulus and a cold stimulus is by segregating those two into different nerve, pop nerve fiber populations that presumably project to different ascending circuitry in the brain so that they get pulled apart and we know easily whether we've touched something hot or cold based on this labeled, separated labeled line uh, uh, situation. And to what extent this pertains and persists into the central nervous system, or, or, or pertains to other stimuli, such as mechanical stimuli, is really too early to tell. But at least this is some uh, a demonstration of how we can now use these molecular probes to understand the coding logic uh, in, the, uh, in the somatosensory system. All right, now, one of the things that uh, one would predict is that our ability to sense temperature, or an animal, or different organisms' ability to sense temperature must vary with their ecological niche. So animals that have different core body temperatures, one would predict, must have detectors whose thresholds are reset according to their core body temperature. Because if these channels all had the same biophysical properties, they would be much less useful to an animal whose core body temperature is, say, lower than a mammal's. Because really, the the task that these detectors have is to be able to detect the difference between core body temperature and outside ambient temperature. And if that doesn't change with core body temperature, then it's not a very useful warning system. So that would be a prediction. And, uh, and so a student in my lab named Ben Myers uh, set out to address this by looking to see uh, what the difference, whether there is a difference in trip channel function, uh, whether you're looking at a warm-blooded animal, such as a rat, or a cold-blooded animal, such as this frog. So uh, what Ben and another student, Yari Siegel, did was simply to remove uh, sensory ganglia from these two animals and at first compare their ability to sense cold and look at the thermal thresholds uh, that these animals have in terms of cold sensitivity. So here's what a rat looks like. And this is very predictable from the properties of the channel that I've already shown you. And that is that when you drop below about 25 degrees, uh, cells that are capable of sensing cold turn on. So what we've done here is to remove ganglia from uh, sensory ganglia from a rat, dissociate the neurons and put them in culture, 
and then use calcium imaging as a means of detecting activation of these, uh, of these um, uh, sensory neurons in response to challenges such as a decrease in temperature. And what we see is that uh, a small uh, subset of cold sensing cells turn on uh, and continue to turn on, of course, as you get colder. They recover, and then these cells are sensitive to cooling agents such as menthol. And when you depolarize all the neurons by putting high potassium on them, you can see all the neurons in the, in the field. So you can see that the cold sensing neurons represent just a specific subset of all the nerve fibers, as you might expect. Now, if you do the same experiment with this cold-blooded frog, what you find is something different, and that is that the frog does have cold sensing nerve fibers that are also activated by menthol, uh, but it takes a much lower temperature to activate them, as you might predict for an animal whose core body temperature is lower. Uh, and so what Ben did then was to clone the genes encoding the menthol receptor from uh, the frog and compare it to that of the warm-blooded mammal. And what you see when expressed is if you develop a temperature response curve, you see that sure enough from these two frogs, Xenophus labus and Xenophus tropicalis, the, uh, the, the cold dose response curve uh, is shifted leftward compared to the mammal. And interestingly, if you do this with the trip MA channel from a chicken, what you find is that it's shifted the other way. And this is presumably because birds have a higher core body temperature than mammals. And so if you look at a correlation plot and you plot core body temperature versus the temperature required for half maximal activation of the channel, what you find is this nice, more or less linear relationship. And so this suggests that, in fact, there is coevolution of trip channel thermosensitivity with core body temperature, which we take as being further genetic evidence that the normal endogenous role for these channels is to detect changes in ambient temperature and to report this into the central nervous system of the animal. Now, recently, we've asked this question of another interesting non-mammalian species that has a very particular and very specialized form of thermosensation. And this has been really sort of an interesting project. It's been a little sidelight, but I think it's really a fun one to work on. And that is uh, to look at these animals. Uh, so this is a western diamondback rattlesnake, something that you would find, say, out in the hills of Palo Alto or the East Bay, as well as in places like Texas. Uh, and this animal uh, has some very interesting properties in terms of its somatosensory and thermosensory function. So, uh, as you may know, pit vipers, quote unquote, see infrared radiation. And they have these specialized organs that I'll talk about in a minute that allow them, well, first of all, they have eyes that you can see here. So, if, uh, if, if you let your dog, little Fluffy, out here in the backyard and it encounters a rattlesnake, the rattlesnake will see it in the same way that we do as a visual object. But in addition to this, the rattlesnake has a sensory modality that we do not possess that allows it to see the dog as an infrared heat map. And so it can detect infrared heat from this animal uh, uh, through these uh, organs on its face, right here, this little hole called a pit organ. So here's a blow up of the head of a rattlesnake. Here's the eye, here's the nostril, and here's the pit organ. And what the pit organ really is, is uh, in essence a little pinhole camera that takes infrared radiation in and projects it onto this little membrane, a very thin membrane that's suspended within this hollow bony cavity. And the bony cavity is innervated not by neurons of the optical system, but by neurons of the somatosensory system. That is trigeminal neurons in this anatomically equivalent somatosensory ganglia that I mentioned, that's equivalent to dorsal root ganglia, sends a very thick plexus, dense plexus of innervation to this membrane. Uh, and this is the membrane that receives the infrared radiation. And if you look inside a rattlesnake's head, what you find is that the trigeminal ganglion is huge compared to that in a mammal. Uh, and aside from being huge, it's, it sends most of its fibers directly to the pit organ. So there are some fibers that innervate other regions of the face, because like a mammal, uh, the rattlesnake needs to be able to sense mechanical and thermal stimuli in other regions of its head. But most of the trigeminal ganglion is devoted to innervating this one little structure. And so this suggests to us that the trigeminal ganglion of a rattlesnake may be somewhat different than that of a mammal because of this sort of ultra-functional specialization. So we wanted to sort of take an unbiased approach to asking how this rattlesnake sends infrared heat and to see if it has any relationship to the mechanisms that we've proposed are involved in sensing, in, uh, sensing uh, other forms of thermal energy uh, in mammals. And so what we did in collaboration with Jonathan Weissman, one of my colleagues at UCSF, was to uh, take a transcriptome profiling approach to this. 
And the logic behind this is as follows. So as I said, the trigeminal ganglion in the rattlesnake, at least based on the anatomy, looks like a very specialized uh, arrangement. Uh, whereas dorsal root ganglia do the same thing presumably in snakes that they do in mammals, which is to provide somatotopic input uh, to, the rest of the, uh, to the rest of the snake, everything basically below the head. Uh, and so the assumption that we made was that if, uh, is that if we compare genes that are expressed in trigeminal ganglia to those in dorsal root ganglia by differential transcriptome profiling, we should be able to pull out molecules that are selectively expressed in the trigeminal ganglion and therefore would be uh, selectively involved in the detection of radiant heat. And one of the things that makes this, uh, um, the, one of the reasons that we did this is because if you compare these two ganglia, as I said, in a mammal, they're genetically equivalent. And so if we saw any differences, we would, we would surmise that it has something to do with the specific attributes of the infrared sensing system in rattlesnakes. And so what Elena Grachiva, a postdoctoral fellow in my lab, did was to carry out differential transcriptome profiling by uh, removing trigeminal ganglia from rattlesnake and dorsal root ganglia and screening for molecules, sensory transducers in an unbiased screen that would be specific for pit organ uh, sensitivity. Uh, and what she found, so this is a plot of the genes, all the genes that are expressed in the rattlesnake dorsal root ganglion versus rattlesnake trigeminal ganglion. And all these little dots are all the genes that are transcribed. And as you can see, they all fall along this unity line, suggesting that their expression in trigeminal ganglion is no different than it is in dorsal root ganglion. And there was only one exception to this, and this was a channel called TRPA1 that I alluded to earlier, the so-called wasabi receptor. So in rattlesnakes, this is the only gene that shows a differential uh, expression in sensory neurons that innervate the pit organ. Uh, and it's about four, at least 400-fold greater expression in trigeminal ganglion compared to dorsal root ganglion. And as a control, if you look at a so-called non-pit-bearing snake, that is a, a snake that is incapable of carrying out infrared detection because it doesn't have this whole system, there are no outliers. Everything that's expressed in DRG is the same as in trigeminal ganglion. Uh, so we surmise that in contrast to mammals, where this receptor, as I'll show you, serves a role in chemosensation, that it has a very specialized role in heat sensation in the snake. So let me give you a, li a, a little background on TRPA1, which I haven't told you about much, other than the fact that it's the target for activation by pungent agents from these sort of mustard-type plants. So what we and other labs have found over the years is that TRPA1 is a very interesting ion channel. It's activated by all these chemical compounds. So allyl isothiocyanate is the pungent ingredient in wasabi. Uh, but in other plants, like um, garlic and onion plants, uh, they're activated by the so-called alpha-beta unsaturated aldehydes, such as allicin and dialdosulfide. And if you look at these compounds, one of, the, one of the question marks is, how do they all activate the same receptor? They really don't seem to have a kind of a common shape or a logic to this. But uh, if you show this to any self-respecting chemist, which we've done, what they'll, what they'll tell you is that they're all united by the fact that they're very reactive compounds and they're strong electrophiles that like to modify, particularly cysteine residues, cysteine amino acids and proteins, but also lysine residues. And in fact, work from my lab and from Arm Potapudian's lab has shown that the way these compounds activate this channel is indeed they make chemical adducts in a reversible covalent manner to cysteine residues on the N-terminal cytoplasmic domain of this channel. And through a mechanism that we still don't understand, this leads to a very robust gating or activation of the channel. And the physiological significance of this, I think, was borne out by some studies by Sven Yort when he was a postdoc in my lab. And that is his realization that what this means is that this is probably a pretty good receptor for a lot of chemically reactive electrophiles that we find in our environment. Uh, one of these, for example, is a, is, a, is a molecule called acrolin, also another alpha-beta unsaturated aldehyde that's produced by burning vegetation, such as cigarette smoke, and in fact is a major constituent uh, of air pollutant, is a major air pollutant. And uh, acrolin, in fact, is what the military-grade tear gas is made of. It's an extreme irritant. Uh, and its main target on sensory nerve fibers is TRPA1. And of course, for people who have asthma or other forms of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, this is a major problem, breathing in irritants like this. And probably the main reason that they irritate the lung and lead to lung inflammation is through activation of this ion channel. Now, in addition to environmental irritants, 
Our body also makes endogenous reactive electrophiles, uh, such as 4-HNE, which is a product of lipid peroxidation that's produced under conditions of oxidative stress. So in conditions such as arthritic joints, it's been shown that 4-HNE builds up to rather high levels. And what we've proposed is that one of the reasons that uh, um, arthritic joints uh, drive neurogenic inflammation is that they produce compounds such as 4-HNE that activate this channel very robustly on nociceptors and lead to the release of neuropeptides and other transmitters that drives this cycle that I refer to of neurogenic inflammation, where you get enhanced inflammation, enhanced pain, and this continued cycle. Uh, so in mammals, what we believe is that the main role of this channel is to serve as a detector of chemical irritants, both exogenous and endogenous. Whereas in a snake, what we think is that evolutionarily this channel serves more of a function in thermosensation. And so when you clone the channel from rattlesnake, what you find is that it's an exquisitely sensitive heat detector. This is now a transfected mammalian cell in which we put the rattlesnake trip A1 channel. And you can see that at around 32 degrees, it's even lower than that, as I'll show you, the channel turns on. And by calcium imaging, imaging you can see these cells uh, being very reactive to heat. Uh, whereas in rat snake, uh, the channel from a, from a, from a snake, a, a related snake that is not a, uh, a pit viper, uh, it is heat sensitive, but it takes a lot more heat to activate the channel. And that's shown uh, in these panels where you can see temperature response profiles to the rat snake versus the rattlesnake. So the rattlesnake trip A1 channel, in fact, turns out to be more heat sensitive than the capsaicin receptor of mammals, and probably to date is, is the most heat sensitive vertebrate ion channel that we or anybody else has looked at. So. Uh, now, there's two other uh, types of uh, snake species that are capable of, of, uh, of infrared sensation, and these are pythons and boas. And without belaboring the point, we carried out the same kind of unbiased genomic screen and found out that, in fact, TRIP-A1, again, is the only outlying gene in these two comparisons, and they both turn out to be heat-activated ion channels. Now, uh, sometime before this, actually, it turned out that Paul Garrity and colleagues at Brandeis showed that the TRIP-A1 ortholog from Drosophila, which is only distantly related to vertebrate ion channels, is also, in fact, a heat-sensitive channel. So during evolution, TRIP-A1 seems to have been the channel that's been selected to serve as a temperature sensor for heat. And in evolution, in vertebrate species, it's taken these two separate paths. Whereas in some cases, uh, it's maintained its ability to serve as a heat sensor. Whether it is in other vertebrates, both, uh, most notably mammals, it's sort of changed roles to now serve as a chemoreceptor. But in any case, I think these studies show, and I think I'll skip this slide uh, in the interest of time, that in the general sense, uh, trip channels are serving as thermal sens sensors under a number of different uh, physiological purposes, not only in terms of nociception, but also in these very specialized uh, functions of somatosensation, such as detecting infrared heat from prey. Uh, and uh, whereas TRIP-V1, TRIP-A1, and, and possibly other TRIP channels also contribute to somatic uh, thermosensation uh, in a number of vertebrate species, including snakes as well as in mammals. So TRIP channels do seem to mediate thermosensation under a wide variety of conditions. All right, now finally, uh, let me uh, end by sort of discussing a topic that's very important. So I've talked about the role of TRIP channels uh, and nociceptors in, a, in acute pain sensation. But as I mentioned earlier, really in the long run, the most interesting question from a clinical perspective is to understand how uh, changes uh, in, in response to tissue or nerve injury lead to enhanced pain sensitivity and chronic pain syndromes. Uh, so as we all know, pain thresholds change in the context of injury. Uh, and we've just shown some examples here that we're all familiar with. You know that if you get a sunburn and, uh, and, and consequent inflammation of the skin, then even light touch or warm temperature become, can become exceedingly painful. Uh, and uh, this is due, at least in part, to changes that occur at the periphery and in the chemical milieu that surrounds the nerve, the, the nerve ending. And what we're interested in is understanding how changes in the local tissue environment drive these changes in nociceptor activation, uh, and to ask whether any of the molecules that we've studied play a role in this shift of gain in the sensitivity of the primary afferent nerve fiber. Uh, and one of the molecules that's turned out to be particularly interesting in this regard is the capsaicin receptor, TRIP-V1. So we, and now many other labs, have shown that these channels really serve uh, as very complex signaling machines 
that is, as polymodal signal detectors. Um, and what I mean by that is that in addition to appreciating changes in ambient temperature, the, and the capsaicin receptor can integrate information from uh, chemical stimuli as well that are relevant to changes uh, in, the chemi in, 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 the, in the tissue in response to injury. So, uh, so when tissue is injured, uh, there's a uh, production of, an, of a number of chemical factors, which together are referred to as the inflammatory soup, that then drive pain hypersensitivity. And these include extracellular protons as one of the hallmarks, tissue acidosis of tissue injury, as well as a number of uh, bioactive lipids, so-called polyunsaturated fatty acids that I alluded to in terms of their importance for regulation of drosophila trip channels, uh, and, uh, and, and as well as other factors that act not directly on, on the trip channel itself, but through uh, G protein coupled receptors or receptor tyrosine kinases, such as bradykinin, ATP, or nerve growth factor, that then signal through PLC and uh, in analogy to the ancestral fly channel, potentiate the activa uh, activation of this channel such that it becomes more sensitive to ambient temperature. Uh, and so what we've shown genetically in data that I don't have time to show you is that in animals that lack the capsaicin receptor, their ability to show enhanced sensitivity to heat in the context of injury is greatly diminished. Giving evidence, providing evidence that this channel is really an important component of the pathway through which injury leads to pain hypersensitivity, particularly in the context of heat hypersensitivity. And what we'd really like to do is to understand how this works at a structural level uh, and a biophysical level, because this is important, I think, for future studies aimed at designing drugs that can modulate these channels in subtle ways, particularly uh, if you want to decrease their activity in the context of inflammatory pain, but not eliminate their activity as warning systems for acute thermal nociception. Um, but this turns out to be a very difficult problem for a number of reasons. One is, as I said, trip channels are very functionally diverse, and they lack, uh, uh, there's low sequence homology. So sequence gazing gives you very little clues about what the interesting functional parts of the channels might be. Uh, there's very little crystallographic data uh, to date, or almost none, to give you some idea of what the structure of the channel looks like and where binding sites for different allosteric regulators might be. And so we and others have tried to take new inroads to doing this. And there are basically two approaches. One is to develop unbiased screens for structure function analysis. And the other is to develop new pharmacological tools to study these channels. Uh, so let me tell you about some work that we've done over the last couple of years to try and identify new pharmacological tools. And again, this brings us back to uh, natural products, but really of a different sort. Uh, and that is to, uh, to turn to toxins. And one of the questions we ask, so we all know that when we get stung or bitten by creatures like this, that this is associated often with intense pain. And interestingly, although this is a very well-recognized phenomenon, we know very little about the mechanisms by which pain is produced. Uh, but what we hoped to do was to learn a little bit more about that, and at the same time to be able to use this as a way to identify new players that are involved in activation of one or more of the channels that we're interested in. Uh, and so, uh, so the question is, why do venomous bites and stings produce pain, and can we leverage this information to understand more about these channels? Now, uh, as many of you know, toxins have turned out to be essential tools for studying receptors, and in particular, studying ion channels. Uh, so for example, in voltage-gated uh, potassium channels, uh, the identification of toxins such as charybdotoxin and hanatoxin from scorpions and spiders, respectively, <coughs> have have provided tools that were used initially to identify functionally important regions of the channel, including the ion permeation pore through which potassium ions flow, as well as regions of the so-called voltage sensor domain that allow these channels to respond to changes in membrane voltage. And in fact, without these toxins, it would have been very difficult to ascertain where these functional re regions of the channel reside. And this is because evolutionarily, these toxins have evolved exquisitely to target regions of the channel that are most important to their function, as you might imagine. And in this case, these toxins block the activation of these channels, uh, which leads to either paralysis or death in the envenomated uh, person or animal. So what we did was to, uh, we, we, I think we made one uh, sort of an intelligent uh, decision here, and that was that if you're looking at, organ at, at venoms that produce pain, most people, when they look at toxins, look for things that block ion channels. 
But of course, if you're producing pain, you want to look for things that activate these channels because that's what's going to activate the nerve fiber and lead to an acute pain response. So Jan Siemens, a postdoc in my lab who now has his own lab in Germany, set up a screen where he used calcium imaging of cells expressing the capsaicin receptor, the wasabi receptor, the menthol receptor, and screened through venoms from lots of different venomous organisms to see if he could find ones that activated these channels. And, uh, and he stumbled across this venom from this one spider called P. Cambridgei, which is better known as the Trinidad, uh, 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 the, the, uh, as the uh, Trinidad chevron tarantula because of the chevron-like pattern, uh, and which is found uh, indigenously in the West Indies. So this is actually sort of a famous spider. I'll show you this little clip. Maybe we could have the lights down so you can, you can see if you can identify this movie and turn up the sound. Is the sound on? Oh, here we go. So. Anybody recognize this individual? <clears throat> this is this, our hero, James Bond. This is the first James Bond movie documentary. And it actually takes place in the West Indies. And um, someone is trying to do in our uh, hero here by putting, you can see, he's sweating like I am. It must be very hot, just like it is Hong Kong. And they've put this little animal under his bed. So this is P. Cambridgei, or the Trinidad Chevron Tarantula. And this is a arboreal spider. And if you were to reach in there and it were to bite you, it wouldn't really kill you, but it would leave you with a very excruciating pain response and then sort of this fulminant inflammatory neurogenic inflammation, probably send you to the hospital. And this is because this animal presumably contains some of these toxins that are very good at activating trip one and maybe other animal channels on the sensory nerve ending. So we wanted to ask what it was about this spider that was so special. Uh, and can see he's very frightened of this, but he always, James Bond always knows how to get out of these situations. So we followed the same protocol and made extracts from the venom gland. Uh, and when you do that, you find that there's a plethora of peptides in this venom gland uh, when you fractionate them uh, by reverse phase chromatography. And again, using calcium imaging, we could find three peaks that had activity at the capsaicin receptor. Uh, and they turn out to be these peptides that are actually uh, um, homologous to other uh, peptides in a family of so-called inhibitor cysteine knot peptides uh, that have been isolated previously by Rod McKinnon and others from tarantulas. Uh, and these peptides uh, bear their name because they uh, have these, uh, this, this pattern of cysteine moieties that are bound up in a very rigid disulfide bonded form which presumably gives them a very high avidity for their target. And in this case, the target is a potassium channel. Uh, and they actually block the potassium channel as a way of silencing neuronal activity. Uh, and in our case, we've identified these three toxins, which we call vanilla toxins, uh, that activate uh, trip V1 to produce pain. Uh, and it turns out that some of these toxins, such as VATX3, is exquisitely uh, selective for activation of the capsaicin receptor. None of these toxins touch any other uh, member of the trip channel family. Uh, but some of the toxins, such as VATX1, are in fact as good an activator of the capsaicin receptor as they are an inhibitor of at least some voltage-gated channels called KV2.1. And there's been speculation that uh, voltage-gated channels and trip channels share a similar overall architecture of having these six transmembrane domains with a so-called reentrant pore loop that forms the ion permeating path. And then four of these subunits come together to form an ion channel. So this is perhaps some evidence to suggest that there is an overall structural similarity between these channels. Uh, and so the questions that come from this are, uh, we know that uh, through work of Rod McKinnon that the inhibitor cysteine knot toxins that inhibit voltage-gated channels bind to this region of the channel, and they prevent the so-called voltage sensor domain from moving in the membrane electric field when the membranes depolarize. And the question is, do, do the vanilla toxins also bind to trip channels in a topologically equivalent domain? And if so, is this an important domain in terms of regulating opening and closing of the channel? And how does binding produce activation of one channel uh, while it produces inhibition of another? And most importantly, can these toxins be used to study different functional and structural states of the channel? Now, this is a, a, a difficult undertaking because doing biochemistry on these channels is, is somewhat challenging. And one of the things that's challenging is that while these toxins are very 
uh, are very selective. They're not extremely potent. That is that their affinity for the channel is not extremely high. So uh, we went looking for other toxins, and we found one from this toxin called the earth tiger tarantula, which is actually found in regions of southern China uh, and Southeast Asia. And this is a much nastier uh, beast than the one that I showed before. Uh, this is a very aggressive spider, uh, and, and its, its venom is actually quite dangerous and can, uh, can, can be lethal in some cases. Uh, so two people in my lab, Chris and Avi, a student, a postdoc, set out to understand, uh, to ask whether this activates the capsaicin receptor. And in fact, its venom is a very potent activator of cells that express the capsaicin receptor. Uh, and upon fractionation, they identified uh, a single peak that encodes a, a, a toxin that activates uh, neurons that specifically express the capsaicin receptor. And let me just tell you briefly a little bit about, about this toxin because it turns out to be quite interesting. So if you uh, record from neurons, stick a microelectrode in these cells and record from neurons and ask how they respond to the toxin, here you see the cells respond transiently and robustly to capsaicin. And then you put on this toxin called DKTX for a reason I'll tell you about in a minute. And it takes a little while for the ion channel to open. And then, even after you wash the toxin out, it stays open for a very long period of time. And if you do kinetic studies of this, what you find out is that whereas capsaicin washes off the channel very quickly with time, uh, produces a very robust current, but then washes away, this toxin stays on the channel and is virtually an irreversible activator of this channel. So DKTX is an irreversible capsaicin receptor activator. Uh, and when you look at the structure, you learn why. And that is that here are the structure of the uh, different vanilla toxins that I showed you before. And here's the structure of the peptide that inhibits voltage-gated potassium channels. And the structure of this double knot toxin is very closely related to these guys. But rather than just being uh, the size of one of these toxins, it's actually double the size. And when you predict what the structure is, would look like, it has two of these knots, uh, ICK knots, that are joined together covalently by this linker. And what this suggests is that the toxin has a bivalency that allows it to bind to different subunits of the channel with very high avidity. So like an antibody, it locks onto its target in a bivalent way and is therefore always on the channel and never is really lets go because it it has, it's bound in two different places. And in fact, we've shown this by engineering a cleavage site, a protease cleavage site here, uh, such that when you clip this into its two component pieces, you retain activity, but you lose this very high affinity for the channel. So this has turned out to be a wonderful probe for trying to identify a region of the channel that's particularly important for gating. And through a whole series of mutagenesis studies that I won't tell you about, except to give you the summary, what we found is that the toxin likes to bind, or binds preferentially, to a region of the channel just around here that, is, uh, that comes in sort of the so-called outer pore domain uh, of the channel that uh, that is sitting just above the ion permeating path. So as I told you before, so if, and if you were to look down on the channel, and this is just an imaginary image of what the channel would look like based on the Rod McKinnon's crystal structure of a voltage-gated channel, the toxin would, so this is looking from the top of the cell down, the toxin would be sitting on the outermost part of the channel, decorating, at least in this case, two adjacent subunits uh, by this bivalency and gating the channel. So this is in contrast to how toxins of very similar structure inhibit potassium channels. So they either sit on the ion permeation pore, but not to modulate gating of the channel, but to physically block the movement of ions through the path. Or they sit on the region of the channel that's most important for gating and, and, uh, and sensitivity of the channel to changes in electric field, namely this, this, uh, this region of the channel in, in the membrane, the so-called uh, voltage sensor domain. In this case, these, to these toxins have evolved to target a region of trip channels that we believe is most important for their modulation and gating, and that is this region of, of the channel that precedes the ion permeation path. And we think this is interesting because this actually turns out to be the area of the channel right here that's also targeted by a number of inflammatory agents such as extracellular protons and enhance the sensitivity of the channel to heat. So we're beginning to get sort of a rudimentary functional map of what some of the important regions of this channel are that are uh, responsible for binding capsaicin and other bioactive lipids uh, that are regulated by phospholipase C or downstream by kinases that are activated by these pathways. And now what we believe is that the region of the channel that's most important for gating is around here. And this is sort of a sweet spot for regulation by allosteric modulators 
that are produced during inflammation lower the threshold of the channel to heat and contribute to pain hypersensitivity. All right, so, uh, so I think this is also a beautiful example of convergent evolution where you have these two different organisms, a plant and an animal, that basically attain the same purpose through two chemically distinct strategies. And that is that they make a peptide or a small organic molecule whose role is to activate pain sensing neurons, say in mammals, as an anti-predatory mechanism to either say, stay away because I'll hurt you, or stay away, don't eat me because I'll hurt you as well. Uh, and they do, throw, do so through targeting exactly the same trip channel, in this case to avert predators, but do so by very different chemical strategies. Really, I think, a very nice example of, of convergent evolution. All right, now, in closing, let me just say how are we thinking about these channels, these channels in terms of therapeutics. Uh, and so these are the three that we sort of uh, fall in love with over the years. And I think the two that are going to turn out to be uh, most interesting, potentially, at least for treating different types of inflammatory pain, and this is still early days, but really are these two channels because of the reasons that I've discussed in the course of this seminar. Uh, and so the development of drugs that interact with these channels that block them uh, could possibly turn out to be added for treating inflammatory pain syndromes such as osteo or rheumatoid arthritis, migraine, inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, we've shown with Pat Manti some years ago that antagonists that block the TRIPV1 channel look like they may be efficacious, uh, more efficacious or probably more efficacious than morphine in, in, uh, in preclinical models, in mice at least, of, of, uh, of diminishing behavior, pain-related behavior that's associated with bone cancer models. And as I said, for TRIPA1, particularly because it's a target for environmental irritants, uh, that uh, targeting these, these receptors on lung may be particularly uh, helpful for people who have asthma and other airway disorders uh, to prevent the sort of neurogenic inflammation that's caused by the, uh, by the inhalation of environmental irritants that target this channel. So I think it's early days. Drug companies are just beginning to, uh, to test uh, compounds for these channels or to develop antagonists for these channels and to try and figure out whether and to what degree uh, they can be useful in treating different uh, pain syndromes and to ask whether they have some side effects, which, which may be the case for some of these, but it's still a little early to tell. All right. Um, let me close by telling you about the people, again, who have done this work. So the snake study that I told you about was done primarily by Elena Gracheva, uh, Julio Cordero Morales, and Nick Angolia uh, in my lab and in Jonathan Weissman's lab, um, uh, who we collaborated with on this. Uh, as well as Aldous Sanchez and John Perez, uh, who provided rattlesnakes from some place called the Natural Toxins Research Center in Kingsville, Texas. Uh, in terms of the uh, toxin studies, Ben Myers, Chris Bolin, Aubrey Priel, and Jan Siemens in my lab did most of that work. Uh, and we collaborated with Charlene Zhu and David King at the UC Berkeley Mass Spec Laboratory to characterize those, those uh, peptides biochemically. Uh, Diana Batista, who now has her own lab at UC Berkeley, and Sven Yort, who now has his own lab at Yale, uh, contributed a lot to the TRIP-M8 uh, knockout studies that I discussed. And I've had a long-standing interaction with my friend and colleague at UCSF, Alan Bassbaum, and in this case, a uh, postdoctoral fellow in his lab, Tetsuro Nukai, who helped us with some of the behavioral studies that I showed you. Uh, finally, let me say that uh, all the work in my lab at UCSF is funded by uh, the generosity of the U.S. taxpayers through the National Institutes of Health. And hopefully they'll continue to be generous. And I wanted to thank you for your generosity and hospitality and for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Julius. Could you please stay for the Q&A section? Certainly. And would Professor Yao please come up to the stage to moderate this session? Thanks, uh, Professor Julius, for his uh, exciting talks. You know, I guess everybody would like the uh, 007 movies, right? <laughs> okay, you know, um, we have, uh, uh, I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Uh, you know, we try to invite in questions from the audience. You can ask all, whatever question you like, strange questions or toxins or snake or spiders or whatever. You know, we also encourage a student from, uh, you know, a graduate student, uh, undergraduate, and also the high school student. Because, uh, you know, we, um, okay, anybody want to ask questions? Yeah. Professor Chung. Yeah. 
Uh, Professor Julius, thank you very much for your lecture, although I don't envy to work in your lab with so many snakes and spiders there. Um, but uh, I, I, uh, I live in Canada for a few years, and Canada is a country for polar bear, not for humans. It's so cold in there. Yeah. So one year I um, had attended a conference in Sydney, Australia, and it was in their winter, and I find that it was so hot, but the temperature was 10 degrees above. Um, so I don't know whether it was my uh, trip we want um, channel being uh, downregulated, or is it my brain which has modulated this um, uh, sensation, uh, telling me that this is not cold. On the other hand, uh, people live in Sichuan, living, uh, eating all this spicy food, keep telling me that it's not spicy and it's not burning their tongue. Right. Again, is it their trip V1 um, disappeared or knockout or uh, whether... <laughs> uh, well, first let me address that question. <laughs> so, this is an interesting question now in terms of what the inner, what, you know, for, for many years people have thought that there must be central detectors of temperature that regulate hypothalamic output to control core body temperature. And one of the questions is what's the relationship between that and peripheral thermosensors such as TRIP-V1? And Initial studies in animals in knockouts of TRIP-V1 or TRIP-M8 done by us and other labs show that there's not really a, that those animals do not change their set point for core body temperature. But of course, those mice have been missing these thermosensors uh, from the beginning. And so there's always chances of adaptation. But I think the most interesting insights come from the use of drugs that block these channels. And so uh, one of the problems actually in development of antagonists for the TRIP-V1 channel in, cl in, in, in recent clinical studies is that a significant portion of pe proportion of people taking these drugs report a feeling of fever. They become slightly hyper hyperthermic. Uh, and it's transient, but their increase in core body temperature is on average about half a degree. And so this suggests that acute modulation of the channel leads to a readjustment of core body temperature, at least temporarily, until CNS and other mechanisms uh, change this. So I think that there definitely is some, there must, this, there must be some input from the periphery, this is how you know what your ambient temperature is, that helps to set your central thermostat. Uh, and what happens after that in terms of uh, what the signaling pathways are and whether there are actually central thermosensors in addition to the peripheral ones is still uh, a, a very interesting, important question. Um, there was something else I was going to say about that observation in terms of, uh, of CNS regulation. But in any case, I think that the, the pharmacological studies are pointing to an important role of peripheral thermosensation as being one of the main determinants of regulating uh, core body temperature. And in hot climates, the reason that people like to eat hot peppers is because uh, this leads to a very robust change in core body temperature, transient, where if you eat hot peppers through vasodilation, sweating, and feedback from the hypothalamus, you actually can shed quite a bit of body temperature and your core body temperature will decrease. So this is one of the reasons why in hot climates people like to eat hot peppers. And if you inject a mouse subcutaneously or IP with capsaicin, its core body temperature will actually drop about six degrees, which is huge, and be maintained at a lower temperature for about an hour or more and then eventually resume. So there is a very interesting feedback, I would suspect, that when you went to Canada, uh, it was at least to some degree a, uh, a, a response to your, to your peripheral sensors measuring this, uh, this profound change in temperature. Now, the reason that people who eat hot peppers say that they don't feel them to be so hot is that you also, there's also a desensitization of the nerve fiber in response to continued use of capsaicin. And probably in those people, they have at least to some degree ablated the trip V1 expressing nerve fibers in their mouth, and so when they ingest hot peppers, uh, they're a little bit more immune to it than, than people who don't eat them on a regular basis. Can I have one more question? Yeah, sure. Um, if I may. Um, the channels seems to, uh, the, although the channels are different, but the response with the ion shifting into, this, into the neurons are similar. Yes. So if you block a channel, would that produce, um, if you block different channels, would, would they produce the same energetic effect? In other words, if you, if you do have a trip A1 mm -hmm. uh, uh, a blocker, um, then you may not feel pain of the arthritis, 
Is it possible that these people can eat very spicy stuff and they don't feel the burning? Well, as well? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, TRIP-A1 and TRIP-V1 show some overlap in expression patterns, but they also are distinct. There are some cells that express the capsaicin receptor that do not express the wasabi receptor. So even if you were to block TRIP-A1, you would not block all the receptors that, ex that are sensitive to capsaicin. Moreover, you would only block calcium entry and sodium entry through that one channel. But any other channel that is open, such as the capsaicin receptor, would still be sufficient to depolarize the neuron and send a pain signal. So blocking one or the other should hypothetically have no effect on that, although activating both could have some synergistic action. And I'm from Tinkabing Secondary School, and um, hello. And I want to ask that you've mentioned uh, many different kinds of um, spiders, and some toxin from spiders will activate the channel, but another kind of spiders, those toxin will um, inhibit those channels. And I want to ask that, um, because there's an old saying in Chinese, we call it yi dok gong dok, and I want to ask if um, if I suffer from a uh, toxin that is activated the channel, can I? Um, neutralize the pain by injecting another kind of toxin that is inhibit those channels. Thank you. Uh, I wouldn't try that at home. <laughs> um, but actually, the only toxins that we've ever found in venom that interact with these channels are activators. The ones that block channels block a different type of channel. And unfortunately for you, if you were to do that, they would block the channel that has an inhibitory effect on the neuron, meaning that, uh, interestingly, in these venoms, there are some toxins that activate excitatory channels and then some toxins that block inhibitory channels, which means that the net result would be super activation of your neurons and you would be in extreme pain. So, uh, so I wouldn't do that. And the, and the spider has ev evolutionarily figured out the best way to maximize activation of your pain pathway through this kind of combined mechanism of super activating an excitatory channel and inhibiting a channel that normally would put the brake on that excitatory action. Okay, just to follow up on that then, does that mean that spiders don't have these receptors so that they can't uh, induce severe pain in themselves? You know, that's an excellent question. We have not looked at that. You know, getting a hold of these spiders is a little tricky. And, um, and the way that we've managed to do these studies is to find people who can milk venom from the spiders for us, and in one case, to, to clone the gene, to identify the full structure of this peptide, we had to make a library, cDNA library from the venom sac of the spider. But the spiders are not easy to get a hold of, at least for us, being in the States, and quantities enough to ask those kind of questions. But you know, in a lot of situations where an organism makes a venom, as you may know, their channels are resistant to those venoms, such in the case of some animals that make tetrodotoxin, they have voltage-gated sodium channels that are resistant to the effects. Whether that's the case in, in, in these animals, we don't know. Um, I, I heard that uh, wine tasters earn a lot of money, even pay better than professors. Now that uh, we know a lot about this uh, trip, can we uh, train ourselves to be better taster? <laughs> <laughs> Um, tasters of spices, you mean, and things like uh, that? Taste or? of wine. Of wine. Yes. I don't have an answer to that. I'm not sure that. <laughs> we talk about that over dinner if there's wine going to be served. <laughs> um, I don't know. That's uh, maybe we can do look at that in the next ten years, but we haven't looked at that yet. The other thing is uh, durian. It's uh, fruit that's uh, obnoxious to some people, but mm -hmm. uh, some people really love it. Yes. So uh, is that because it, they, uh, when they, you know, they get adapted to it, or is it something I to think do? that's probably more of a gustatory response and maybe sort of plays into the, uh, the people's uh, differences genetically as to whether they certain taste and are perceived as sweet or bitter or sour or whatever. So I think that's probably more of a gustatory mechanism than it is a pain mechanism. Yes, um, thank you, Professor Julius. And I'm a postgraduate student. And I would like to know uh, from your mind, or um, from a drug development perspective, do you think it would be easier to develop a drug that acts on the peripheral system? For example, we can just apply it as a cream or ointment, mm -hmm. compared with um, we have to find a drug that has to act on the central brain system. Because um, So how do you weigh about this peripheral versus the central system? Right, so you know, one of the attractions to these channels is that, although there's some debate about this, uh, that their most robust expression, and maybe in some cases <clears throat> their exclusive expression, is peripheral as opposed to central. Uh, 
<clears throat> and so these are the kind of targets that people have been looking for in the pain field for a long time because in contrast, say, to opiate receptors that are expressed in the brain stem and other places of the CNS, where you therefore have problems of respiratory depression and addiction, these uh, uh, proteins, some of these trip channels, are exclusively or largely a pri uh, or, or predominantly expressed in the periphery which means that even if you took a drug orally, their main mode of action should be peripheral and should spare side effects that are due to interaction with uh, CNS neurons. And so, you know, that's sort of the hope that, uh, and now in terms of peripheral uh, used ointments, well, people have been using capsaicin as a topical application for many years. Uh, and in some cases, that can be very useful for treating some kind of peripheral pain syndromes. But most drug companies, what they're hoping for is a pill that you can swallow. Uh, where you don't have to rub on a sab, or where you can treat pains that are also internal but on peripheral organs, such as in visceral or vascular target organs. And for that, you can't rub on a sab but need to take something orally. But the hope is that there will be more selective selectivity because these channels are not expressed at appreciable levels in the CNS, or at least that's the way we feel. There's some disagreement about that. But I think uh, whichever side of the fence you're on, their expression is much more uh, 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 robust peripherally than central. Francis. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Julius, you have mentioned that um, sensory neurons have two functions. One is to sense pains and heat and so on to the central nervous system. The other is uh, to the periphery, where it could cause uh, neuro neurogenic inflammation. So uh, are these two, two, two events uh, controlled differently? or? or? You know, how does the, the nerve... Um, well, they come from the same origin, namely activation of the primary afferent nociceptor. And presumably, you know, the inflammatory part is to, uh, is to lead to pain hypersensitivity so that you really protect and guard that area. And also perhaps to bring circulating cells into the area to help deal with infections and things like that. Um, at some level, they are separate, but uh, in, in, the, in their initiation, they, they result from the same initial depolarization of the nerve fiber. The way I think to, but, but, the, but you can separate them in terms of therapeutics, because what you really want to do is, uh, is after the injuries occur, decrease activation of these uh, receptors peripherally so that you can prevent further activation of the nerve fiber. What you really want to do is break that cycle so that when you have inflammatory mediators that get produced like extracellular protons, bradykinin, and all these things that then feed back on the primary afferent to enhance activity of these channels, that you then silence the channel to prevent that from occurring and then producing further infl neurogenic inflammation. So if you can intervene anywhere in there, uh, then presumably that will help tamp down the situation. And probably the most specific way to do that in the nerve terminal is to silence the channels that are on the nerve terminal itself, as opposed to trying to decrease levels of production of the inflammatory mediators, which is much more difficult to do, which is really what aspirin does, uh, but you know has its various side effects. Because these inflammatory mediators are ubiquitous and produced by all kinds of cells, and the targets that you would have to target to decrease that are present in all cells in your body, which is why you have issues of liver and kidney toxicity with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So, so I guess uh, normally we have uh, different thresholds for sensing pain and causing neurogenic inflammation? Um, well, that's a good question, actually. And I don't know that there's been a very good study to say how much you need to activate the nociceptor to feel an acute pain response versus how much you need to activate it to get a robust neurogenic inflammation. Um, and uh, that's a good question, whether you can experience acute pain and not have uh, inflammation. You, you can, actually, because if you take a little bit of capsaicin, you will sense something. If you take more, then your lips will become swollen and pouty, and that's the neurogenic inflammatory part. So I think it takes more to get the really robust neurogenic inflammation than it does to feel the initial acute pain sensation. And you can, you know, obviously hurt yourself by touching something warm. Uh, and know that it's too warm to touch without getting an inflammatory episode, which usually requires something that's a stimulus that's intense enough to actually cause tissue injury as well. Uh, Professor Julius, thanks very much for a night and talk. I'm a clinician. I want, want, I want to ask a very practical questions. Of course, it would be ideal if we can have a drug that don't affect the central nervous system. But the hand, if we uh, get a drug, uh, one of the trip uh, antagonists, that is very specific. Will it uh, behave the same way as... Uh, uh, sort of uh, NSAIDs, which affect other GI system things, that, which can give us equally bad side effects. 
or we can target well, very specifically just on the well, the side of effects would have to be if if it's really selectively expressed peripherally on nociceptors, then any side effects would have to be related to activation uh, to inhibition of nociceptor function. So there's no evidence that these channels are expressed, for example, in in kidney or in uh, uh, you know non-neuronal cells. Uh, there there are there's there's some there there are some reports that these channels are expressed in other sites. Uh, and, and some of this is based on sort of disparate information, like looking at immortalized cell lines and things like this. But in terms of, uh, you know, real evidence for functional expression of these channels in vivo on non-neuronal tissues, there's really not much convincing evidence, at least for TRIP-V1 uh, and, you know, TRIP-A1. Um, and so I think, you know, it'll be empirical to some degree. And even if there are expression on some peripheral sites, I think at that level it becomes empiric. But most of the evidence suggests that their main sites of expression and action are on uh, cells of the somatosensory system. Uh, there's a, you know, there may always be some expression in other areas that we don't know about yet, but it's different than, say, looking at cyclooxygenases or opiate receptors, where we know that there is very robust expression outside of the primary afferent nociceptor. But if this is the case, how far are we, if you want to venture a guess, how far are we away from a commercial available oh, well, preparations? You know, I, I don't know. I, I'm not, that's a, different, that's a different goal than I have immediately. I mean, I'm not in a drug company, but, um, you know, just based on what I read in the newspaper and the literature, I would say that, you know, drug discovery and clinical trials take, you know, somewhere between five and 15 years. So I would say for trip v one antagonists, there are some good drugs out there now. There is some indication that they can be used to treat inflammatory pain. I think pharmaceutical firms are wrestling with this issue of hyperthermia. If they can get around that or decide that maybe it's not a big problem because it's quite transient, uh, then you know maybe in the next five years we'll see whether these drugs are really efficacious. I think for the other channels, you know they've been cloned later, and so it's, we have to add on some years to that. Uh, so optimally, I would say, you know, in the next five years, but it's very, as you know, very hard to predict for drug studies what that will be. Good evening, uh, Professor Julius, and I'm a local high school student. I have a question about the potential side effect of capsaicin. Uh, I, would like to, I would like to know whether it will trigger any allergic reactions or, or develop a, psycho, a physiological dependence on human if it is really made uh, commercially available uh, in the market. And uh, one more question to to ask is that uh, does it act on exert its, exert its effect on maintenance neuron or stretch neuron? Uh, that's all for my questions. Well, I'm sorry. What was the last part of your question? Uh, does capsaicin exert its effect on maintenance neurons or stretch neurons? On on stretch neurons was that stress neurons? Well, oh, stress neurons. In, you mean in in the central nervous system in terms of stress neurons? Yes. Um, you know, there's, some, there's been some reports that TRIP-V1 is expressed on neurons in the CNS, for example, in the, in the, in the um, hippocampus, which is based on sort of indirect studies looking at, uh, at, at, at physical phenomena such as long-term depression. Uh, in terms of molecular evidence or functional evidence for direct expression of receptors in the brain, we really haven't seen very much. So I think in terms of uh, effects of these drugs outside the primary afferent, I would say that uh, at least to my mind, they're going to be minimal. Well, and, and therefore, I would say that in terms of use dependence and things like that, I wouldn't expect there to be any. Um, but, up there. <laughs> oh, you're way up there. I was trying to see where you were. I forgot that there's a balcony up here. Uh, and so, um, you know, I don't know. I think that will be, but, the, you know, there's no evidence to suggest that they would be like opiates in that case. Um, and, but uh, again, I think in terms of drug development, it's, uh, you know, there's still a lot of empirical observation here. But I would say that there's less of a chance in this case because of their limited expression outside of the peripheral nervous system. And I don't know too many people who have become really addicted to capsaicin or have withdrawal effects when they stop eating hot peppers. So, uh. uh, hi, Professor. Uh, I'm still a high school student, and I'd like to ask about the instant pain and the after pain, like uh, tick a fire as the stimuli, and when I'm being burned, I instantly feel painful. But after the, fire, the flame is gone, I continue to feel pain, but there's no stimuli continu continuing acting on me. So are there any differences between the two kinds of painful feelings, or are they the same? 
Well, that's a good question. I think the longer lasting pain when you burn yourself is probably due to pain from tissue injury and the beginnings of inflammation. So if you, uh, if you remove the heat source uh, there's, and you've actually had some tissue damage occur, then there will be pain as a result of that. Yeah, that's a good, right. So the question is, can these toxins be used to facilitate the growth and, uh, and structural determination for protein crystals? <clears throat> um, and we're hoping that that's the case. That was one of the motivations to look for these things. The problem is, is that the toxins, we can make them in, uh, by expressing them in bacteria. But the bacteria has to then fold the toxin in this sort of very specific way because there's a lot of disulfide bonds. And that turns out to be a very inefficient process. And so while you can make enough for biophysical studies, it's hard to make enough for structural studies. But that's something that we're working on. I have one more question. <laughs> and there's uh, another question uh, besides, uh, besides when the spiders, I want to ask about the snakes. <laughs> and <laughs> And I want to ask that um, the snakes, they can detect the uh, uh, infrared, uh, right? Yes. And um, does that mean that there's a structure within those channels that can resonance with different wavelengths of the um, infrared, just like the coral field can resonance with the wavelengths of light? Right. So, you know, one of the questions that's that there are not that many studies on snake infrared sensation in terms of biophysics, but one of the main questions that people have had is whether the detection of infrared radiation occurs through a phototransduction-like process that you've talked about, <clears throat> where you're actually looking at, you know, wavelength-specific uh, um, photolysis, or where, or uh, whether it's specifically related to the ability of long wavelength red light to heat, to transmit heat, incident heat to tissue, and then that's measured as radiant heat as opposed to photons. Uh, and the evidence from the few studies that were out there from nerve recordings suggested that it's the latter, that it's really a, a thermal transduction process rather than a photochemical transduction process. And that sort of made sense to us because the innervation to the pit organ is not from the optic system but from the somatosensory system. And, you know, our studies would suggest that it really is the latter. But what's happening is that the uh, infrared heat the infrared radiation is heating up the tissue in that little pit membrane, that very thin membrane, and then that's imparting a thermal stimulus to the nerve fibers that are innervating that tissue, and they're picking up the incident radiant heat as opposed to light. And so we think it's a thermal transduction process rather than a photochemical transduction process. So it's not sampling different wavelengths of light. And if you're below, say, 700 nanometers of light, you don't heat up the tissue enough to actually activate the channels. OK, I think it's running late. It's have been a long day for Professor yeah. Julius. And he has uh, many events already before that one. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, let's give him a uh, uh, thanks him for exciting talks. Thank you very much. Thank, okay, you. thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Julius and Professor Yao. May I invite Professor Julius to stay? We shall now call appoint Professor Joseph So, the Vice Chancellor of the Chinese University of Hong Kong, to present the souvenir. Professor So, please.